Here's a map of some of the f units in Death Valley. Remember, we're looking at that Beck Springs, Kingston Peak Formation, and the Noonday Dolomite. And then be below that would be that Crystal Springs and Horse Thief Formation that's a little bit older than this. So these are part of the Pahrump group, and then the Cap Carbonate would be the Noonday Dolomite. But what this graph is showing, carbon isotopes, at least in this region up here where we think this last glaciation, the this last glaciation called the Mary Noen glaciation had elevated values of carbon-13, which means that carbon-12 was removed and sequestered. But then what happens here is we're seeing a drop in the carbon-13 isotopes for these cap carbonates, which means that there's release of that carbon-12 and it dilutes the carbon-13. And again, these are rocks in the Death Valley region, the Panamint Ranges, and down here in the Kingston Ranges, Silurian Silurian Hills down in Death Valley region. And then here's another look at some of these uh, glaciations. So that Sturtian Glaciation and the Marinoan Glaciation. And again, this is showing that drop in the carbon-13 isotopes here. And interestingly, this one is also, some of the ages are constrained by fossils. And so these little uh, vase-shaped microfossils, which are probably uh, eukaryotic cells that developed uh, during this time. And we find them in units that are older than Sturtian glaciation here. And there's, uh, these are from the, Kings, from the Kingston Peak Formation and Beck Springs Formation here. This is actually from the Grand Canyon region. Uh, but you can see they're similar. They have that vase-shaped shape tapering uh, type of microfossils. And then at the top here, we have the Noonday Dolomite, the cap carbonate. The age constraint here is that worldwide, it's, it coincides with the base of this Ediacarian fauna. And we'll talk about this in a moment. It's where we really start seeing multicellular organisms, soft-body organisms, building communities, and really animals taking off here right around 635 million years ago. And that corresponds to, the, to this uh, noonday dolomite here. So now let's look at this evolving atmosphere. At the beginning of the Proterozoic, there was no more than 1% free oxygen than we have today's pretty low concentrations. By the end of the Proterozoic, oxygen concentrations were no more than 10% the current value. So it's, again, it didn't increase. One of the things we, we find in terms of evidence of what's happening to all this oxygen, because there's that photochemical disassociation and then photosynthesis is occurring, is that we have this oxygen sink. And oxygen sinks are removing the free oxygen from the atmosphere. And mostly there are these banded iron formations. Uh, remember, we talked about how mid-oceanic ridge is going to produce the reduced iron, and that easily dissolves in water. But then once it encounters oxygen, it's going to precipitate as an oxidized iron or rust, and it's going to make these banded iron formations. Oxygen-producing stromatolites did not become common until about 2.3 billion years ago. Over time, as free oxygen increased, carbon dioxide decreased. So here's an example, one of those banded iron formations. So they began about 2.3, 2.4 billion years ago. They're a combination of this red jasper chert, which is silica. So chert is a sedimentary rock, which is primarily microcrystalline quartz or silica. And then this silvery gray material is that hematite or magnetite, which is the iron. So that's the, so these are these banded iron formations. They and they're very abundant, primarily in the Proterozoic. In fact, we'll see that 92% of the banded iron formations formed between 2.5 to 2 billion years ago. So that's really in the Paleo-Proterozoic. And so banded iron formations, remember the ferrous iron is a reduced iron. Uh, and we knew, know that was, there was quite a bit of ferrous iron during the Archean. Uh, but as oxygen levels increased, it was oxidized to ferric iron, and that's that oxidized iron. And so here we see that ultraviolet radiation and photochemical dissociation is producing oxygen here. Remember, only about 2% there for oxygen. The bulk of it is being produced by oxygen-producing phytoplankton and cyanobacteria, and they're going to be reducing that, or they're going to be oxidizing that reduced iron here. And then usually because we have upwelling currents that are bringing this dissolved iron from deep, deeper waters. Once they encounter the oxygen at shallower levels, they're going to precipitate and form the banded iron formations. Another evidence for increasing oxygen levels in the Proterozoic are these red beds. 
and we start seeing these continental red beds again showing that by about 2.3 to 1.8 billion years ago now not only their oxygen in the oceans but we're starting to see it in the atmospheres and we're starting to oxidize terrestrial sediment some of the earliest forms of life we find are the single-celled prokaryotic cells so these are uh, some single-celled microfossils from the Gunflint Chert in Canada and Ontario. When we look at these first fossil organisms, we find that we primarily find prokaryotic uh, cellular organisms. And so prokaryotic, so this word karyo means cell, so pro means what came before. So these cells, single cells, and they lack a nucleus. They have the free-floating DNA. And for prokaryotic cells, uh, they're, they're smaller than the eukaryotic, so a true nucleus. And you can think of a eukaryotic cell as sort of like a community of prokaryotic cells sort of working together with a central nucleus, DNA, and chromosomes in the, in the nucleus. But then they have mitochondria, which have their own DNA, and they're providing other functions, specialized functions in the cell. But for a prokaryote, it's, just, it's like a single mitochondria can, can produce proteins and can, can live on its own. And you'll find that prokaryote organisms are bacteria and archaea. Usually, some biologists call this kingdom Monera, but we can call it a eubacteria kingdom and the archaea kingdom. And then we find that for the eukaryotic cells, because there is a central nucleus or larger cells, they have specialized organelles. These include the protists, the fungi, plantea, and animalia. So the question is, during this protozoic time, we're finding that we see stromatolites. And stromatolites are primarily bacteria, and they're going to be prokaryotic cells. But by, by the end, or of, by the neoprotozoic, we, be, we begin to see eukaryotic cells through a process called endosymbiosis. So what does endosymbiosis involve? It was proposed in 1905, but really... In the 1970s, work done by Lynn Margulis, who published work on looking at the mitochondria of eukaryotic cells, and she discovered that these mitochondria have their own DNA, and she called it mDNA for mitochondrial DNA. So here's an example. We have some prokaryote host and some aerobic bacteria. They interact, and what happens, they start working together in terms of like a community. Or we could have a series of blue-green algae joining up with a prokaryotic host. And here in this case, we get some eukaryote that has organelles that are chlorophyll, which are really these blue-green algae, and they're providing energy and food for the rest of the cell. Whereas for um, a cell that doesn't do photosynthesis, then they'll animals and fungi will have to consume and get their energy by the food that they intake. But it, So endosymbiosis is really other cells living within a different cell, this endosymbiosis. Some of the oldest eukaryotic cells we find are these bangiomorpha, which are multicellular eukaryotic cells. It's about 1.2 billion years old. And then another even older fossil at 2.1 billion years, probably multicell, but it looks like this uh, Grypania, 2.1 billion years old, is the oldest known megafossil. It was probably a bacterium or some kind of algae. Uh, so again, it was probably a prokaryote, but certainly for the first eukaryote, Bangiomorphia at 1.2 billion years old is our first candidate there. Other microfossils we find are these things called acritarchs. And acritarchs are algae, maybe phytoplankton cysts. Uh, certainly, there are probably eukaryotic organisms that did photosynthesis. Uh, also, we see these vase-shaped microfossils, which are also cysts of eukaryotic, maybe photosynthetic organisms. We find these in the Kingston Peak Formation, in the Beck Springs Formation, in Death Valley, and also in the Grand Canyon. Once these cells start grouping together, start working together, start relying on each other, and become specialized, they become organisms. There are fossils called gone goneum, which are as little as four fossils living together, but each fossil or each cell can live individually. But in this case, they chose to be together, maybe for protection, maybe they can get food more easily as they work together. But the first true multicellular organism is Volvex here, and this one it does have specialized cells. 
So what are the benefits of being multicellular? A single cell, if it gets bigger, what's going to happen is it's going to lose its surface area and it's going to not efficiently transfer materials across that cell membrane. By, work, by me multicellular, then different cells can, get spe can provide specialized functions. Number two, multicell organisms live longer and can replicate cells and have more offspring. Cells have increased functional efficiency when they are specialized. And another thing is working together, you can get more food. So let's talk about this Edia carinfana. So this is probably the first multicellular eukaryotic community of animals that we find in the fossil record. And it dates back to about 635 million years. That's a, a, the base of that noonday dolomite. But the type of loca locality is the Ediacaran Hills in Australia. And some of the video you'll see in this week, uh, we'll, we'll talk about these. And so this Tribachidium, which resembles some sort of echinoderm, sand dollar-like organism. Charnia, which is uh, a strange organism. It looks like a plant, but it really is some sort of animal that lived on the deep sea floor, dark sea floor, no sunlight, so it wasn't doing photosynthesis. It was probably collecting energy from the sediments around it. Sprigynia, which is uh, this impression, you're seeing maybe the beginning of arthropods, an early arthropod. So the, again, these are dating to about 635 to about 560 million years old. And so again, it's a community of organisms uh, living in, during this time. And so here's uh, that Charnia. And then we also see some cone-shaped fossils that may be the predecessors to corals here. And so here are those early corals. And then we have this fossil called Kimberella, which is probably a mollusk, maybe some sort of you know, related to sea snails or maybe an abalone, but certainly that's the beginnings of, of different phyla are starting to shape like arthropods, nidarians for the corals, and then the, um, the mollusks here for the Kimberella. So in this Edicaran fauna, we see the beginnings of, of nidarians, which are the soft bodied jellyfish organisms, sea anemones, corals. We see beginning of annelids. Annelids are the worms, the worm phyla. We see the beginning of arthropods, which are the crustaceans, like crabs, lobsters, and eventually the terrestrial ones will be the insects and the arachnids. But one thing they all shared in common, they were soft-bodied, but they were widespread. We find them in North America, in Australia, in, in, in Europe, in China, in Africa. So again, showing that life was really taken off during this time.